Uh, good day, dear listeners. It's Steve Prada here with the Management Blueprint Podcast. And today's guest here with me is Steve Salis, who is a serial consumer brands entrepreneur and investor. He's the founder of Salis Holdings that has ownership interests in 14 companies in a diverse spectrum of industries, including restaurants, consumer, digital and technology, food and beverage, hospitality and the real estate. So without further ado, Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me, Steve. Good afternoon to you. It's great to have you on the show. So, uh, so let's plunge in. And uh, my first question is always the same. You know, what's been your journey? How did you come here? How did you get here? What uh, made you an entrepreneur? Yeah, so um, I think every entrepreneur has a unique uh, journey, I, I suppose, to how they ground themselves as to uh, when and why they become one. I think for me, there was really a couple points that I would point to, but actually really more, probably more one. Um, I, uh, I grew up uh, in New Hampshire and I uh, was raised there and I ended up going to school on a scholarship to play basketball uh, and stay in state and play at the University of New Hampshire. And uh, after my freshman year in college, um, I was playing in a summer league game with some very talented basketball players uh, that were playing in Europe. And I'll never forget after the game, we were standing on the sidelines and uh, I asked them, I said, so how is it? How's it going? Uh, you know, what do you like about it? And they were just so energetic and so excited about playing in Europe. I believe one gentleman was playing in Ireland. The other one was playing in Czechoslovakia. And um, you know, they were just kind of almost bragging to me about uh, about the experiences they were partaking in. And one of them was they were talking about what they were making. And one was making 85000 a year. And the other one, I think, was making 75000 a year. And um, each had their own uh, places by which uh, they were put up for free. And they had a car that was given to them for free. And, you know, I remember thinking to myself, boy, that's not that's not really enticing to me. And you know, it's kind of a really uh, significant eye-opening event because, you know, I was good enough to play in Europe, I suspect. I was already talking to various teams in Europe, uh, even though I was only coming into my sophomore year in college. And it, it was kind of like a defining moment where I, I said, you know, I tell people, I, I was looking sort of at a, an impending cliff staring at me in the face. And, you know, not to poo-poo people's dreams and aspirations because everyone's entitled to lead the life that they want to fulfill. But when I looked at it, I looked at two, two guys who were very talented uh, at their craft, but really in a lot of cases were, you know, sort of exceeding their, their time by which, uh, or buying their time or prolonging their time uh, for which eventually they were going to have to get into the real world. And that scared me because I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be behind that eight ball. I wanted to be in front of it. And so I thought a lot about that conversation through my sophomore year in college and um, decided inevitably uh, at the end of my sophomore year that I was going to leave school and drop out. And uh, before I did that, uh, I really needed to gut check it because it was a pretty significant move. I was the first uh, kid, I believe, in my entire family to go to school uh, without having to pay for tuition. Um, you know, in a lot of cases with leading a life that initially I wanted to lead, but then I kind of felt like it was really more the life that I was leading that my parents or my grandparents or others wanted me to lead. And so decided that, uh, you, you know, that I needed to, 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 to go in a different direction. And so all I asked for them was to respect me and love me and appreciate, you know, my decision um, and that, uh, you know, I wanted to go and, and do something else. And, and, and frankly, what that was, was, you know, kind of really going against the grain and, and leaving school, uh, dropping out after my sophomore year and moving to New York City um, by where, you know, I really had to learn the ins and outs of life. And, you know, it was at the time, probably, or I dropped out 20, 21 years old. I was there for like a year. I started out working in odd jobs, fashion industry, uh, catering. And then I got into the, the, the lounge and the bar and the club business, learned a lot about that business. And it, it just kind of dawned to me when I was watching the way things were getting done and, and just how inefficient things were, at least from what I was seeing. And, um, I thought to myself, I think I could do, I could do a good job at, at perhaps doing this and I want to try things on my own. And so uh, that led to, to me doing that and um, ended up having a couple of nice successes by the time I was in my mid twenties. And then uh, from there had the, the super bug and have been an entrepreneur really since then. Um, and so, 
you know, for me, I, I don't tell people not to go to college because um, I do think college, definitely depending on what you're, you're, you're seeking, um, can be a wonderful, um, you know, opportunity for you, whether it's learning more about yourself, you know, removing yourself from comfort zones because you're no longer staying at your house, uh, engaging in a lot of new experiences, uh, and of course, maybe getting an education. But for me, yeah, two years was enough. And um, I got what I needed out of college and uh, I was able to move forward and, and take whatever I learned and try to apply it. But, you know, really, there's not a better way of being an entrepreneur than just sort of getting in and figuring it out. So Steve, uh, tell me about the pizza business. So you got, after that, you got into the pizza business and you built uh, like a nine figure business. Tell, tell us a little bit about that, like a, a short version of it. How, how did it uh, happen? Yeah, so, you know, around uh, 29, see, 2009, yeah, 2009, I had a, I had a bar, Mexican bar um, restaurant in the West Village of Manhattan. And, you know, being that at that time I was in New York for the better half of five or so years, you know, there's really a pizza shop on, on every block. And, you know, the funny thing about pizza in New York is that there are so many different layers and levels of pizza uh, and the quality of pizza. You know, we talk, a lot of people talk about how great the pizza is in New York. And um, I grant you, you know, the, the upper, upper echelon, not necessarily from a value prop, you know, value or cost side, but just there's, there's an array of various things on the upper echelon of, you know, whether it's by the slice or, or sit down or fine dining. It has some of the best unequivocally in the world, but there's a lot of not so good product. And I saw a business really that, that needed to get materially disrupted. It was highly bastardized. And I found, I found that there's probably would be a way for that to be disrupted. And so what we tried to do is sort of bring the speed, efficiency, and convenience of buy the slice pizza, but we wanted no pre-made product. And we wanted to bring a semblance of quality and, and sophistication you get at a casual or fine dining product offering, um, which, you know, at that time you were seeing a massive foodie emergence taking place, you know, finer dining chefs that were really taking pizza, you know, on the base of pizza and, and really sort of expanding the horizons of how to engage uh, and consume pizza, you know, beyond just sausage, peppers and onions and pepperoni and cheese. And so, you know, we wanted to, um, bring those dynamics and sort of meld them together. Uh, and that's how the pizza business started. And, you know, we wanted to build a brand that had great strength to it, where pizza in a lot of cases was the conduit to, um, you know, to life, to community, to friends, to family. You know, my co-founder and I, you know, we, we grew up in small towns. And so the, the local pizza parlor or the pizza shop to us were, was a very profound place. Uh, where, you know, as we were going through and building this brand, you know, we recognized that uh, you could argue the pizza was good enough and maybe not so good enough, but it almost became ancillary to what pizza did, which was really to bring uh, people together um, to share fond memories and to have extraordinary experiences. And, uh, you know, a lot of my fondest memories growing up really were around pizza, um, whether it was actually in the pizza shop or uh, even at my home, you know, and so um, we wanted to try to sort of modernize that mom and pop pizza shop experience. And mm -hmm. that, that coupled with the, you know, made to order personalization, customization of pizza and, and bringing that foodier, finer uh, food, you know, sourcing dynamic to the table at a highly approachable value um, proposition is really the essence of, of Ann Pizza. And so, you know, that idea was birthed in New York, but you know, we, we quickly decided as, as tough as it was uh, to, to make the decision, it was really uh, the right decision, which is not to build in New York. And so, you know, we traveled the country for a while and um, went to a bunch of emerging markets and ended up in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, never came here in my entire life, but, uh, you know, took a, took a train down from Penn Station to, to Union Station and <clears throat> rest was kind of history, you know, got here, um, toured the market for three hours, thought that this was the right place. And uh, both him and I moved, you know, late summer 2011, uh, built our first store in 2012. And the rest was kind of history. You know, we uh, built our store, I thought in a very, it was funny because the first store really was an accumulation of um, kind of getting passed by 
by the community here in Washington, DC, but not for the reasons that normally you would get passed by. I mean, we had money uh, to build a store. We had enough experience to open a store. Um, two areas that are always concerning, I think, you know, for a landlord when they're thinking about worthiness or the quality of the tenant. But really the bigger issue for us was trying to convince uh, landlords on using a, um, you know, a proprietary oven technology that was non-vented because um, people had a really hard time figuring out how do you cook, you know, gourmet pizza in 90 seconds and mm -hmm. uh, do it without, without a vent. And so that was a big, that was a big hurdle for us. And we ended up opening our first store in an area that, you know, looking back on it was really, I think, so crucial to the essence of how Ann was, was birthed, which was, we went into a highly transitional, highly gentrifying neighborhood. You had folks that have been living here for, you know, tens upon tens of years. You have a new constituency of, of people moving into the neighborhood. It was very, you know, again, transitioning and transitional. And this was an environment where everyone felt like they belonged. Uh, it didn't matter what you did or didn't do or how much money you did or didn't have or uh, whether you lived in the neighborhood for 45 years or you just moved in the neighborhood three months ago. It was an environment where everyone felt like they belonged and they all got to share great experiences through that conduit, which was pizza. And that's why we called it Ann Pizza in the first place. Okay. So, you know, and then the rest is kind of history. We built that thing up. Um, I ran the company as CEO till for about four, for about five years. Uh, and then I, I uh, successfully sold uh, my position in the business in, in 2019. And, um, you know, in 2015, um, set up my, my, my holding company, which you referenced uh, earlier. And, um, you know, really over the last five to six years, you know, have accumulated an array of, of companies, but really with sort of one singular mentality or North Star, which is, you know, to focus on, you know, making the everyday exceptional uh, and really thinking about how to, you know, sort of aggregate, you know, great brands that offer affordable and luxurious experiences uh, through premium food, through premium service, through premium, uh, again, experiences uh, and offering them at highly approachable price points. And so, um, you know, I think that, you know, that's that's been sort of a, a hallmark for us. And so whether we're in restaurants or retail or consumer or tech or wholesale or manufacturing or even real estate, it's really just thinking about that. How do you create premium and luxe, luxurious experiences, but then how do you sort of, you know, bring the right sort of value uh, proposition or, you know, the right value angle mm -hmm. so that you're pricing the masses in. You know, mm -hmm. I, I believe that people should be able to treat themselves more frequently. And um, that's why when we talk about making the everyday exceptional, you know, we have to first do that internally and then try to do that externally. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm taking some notes here. Uh, I love this idea of uh, you know bringing the exceptional experience to the masses and uh, and how do you how do you create a business out of that and, and build this this brand? So uh, right now you have fourteen different brands right in Stellas Holdings. This is what I I read on your LinkedIn page. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's about right. Fourteen different, and you are investing in these different businesses. Now you mentioned in our previous conversation you mentioned that the private equity business model is broken and you're looking for something different. So, so how, why is it broken and how different uh, is your approach? Well, I think it's broken on a couple levels. I think first and foremost, you know, it was broken prior to COVID um, where there is an incongruence uh, between the, the great companies in this country, which all things that are great take time to harvest and mature and develop uh, they generally exceed uh, the timeline by which capital uh, needs to be deployed and needs to exit. Um, and so I think you have an issue there. I think secondarily is, um, you know, when, when you have a short timeline for capital uh, deployment and for capital to be returned, it tends to at times put the operators, the founders, the entrepreneurs, the owners, the operators of the business in a precarious place by where Sometimes they're making decisions chasing the wrong things, which could materially puts your business at risk, mm -hmm. such as chasing rates of returns, 
uh, because you have to give money back fast uh, because you took the money um, versus making the right decision for the long term of the business. Private equity, in short, generally takes shorter views of the world. Extraordinary brands take the long views of the world. And so that's also an incongruence. And I think lastly is, and I'll, I'll make this more specific to the restaurant industry, and I saw this firsthand in building pizza, is you know uh, building any company today to support the modern consumer um, is not linear. Um, it's not linear, okay? So you know, the days of like, let me give you money and let's build 20 new restaurants and they're all gonna cost X dollars and you're gonna build them out in X time. And um, you know that sort of mentality um, is highly flawed because the, the reality is there aren't perhaps 20 good locations. And so you could be signing uh, not so optimal opportunities or deals just to chase a unit count, but get a bad deal as a result. I think today the consumers now are smarter, experiences are more impactful, um, multi-channel for distribution, channel segmentation is more important than ever before. And so when you're thinking about different channels to connect with your customer, how you get to them, how they get to you, um, and what you need to do to invest in that uh, to me, I think is making the world less and less linear in front of our very eyes. And so, you know, my, my rule of thumb is, you know, the days of black and white, you know, being the ends of the book ends of the spectrum will, will continue to be the bookends, but the ones that are able to operate in the different hues of gray, which effectively are all the shades between black and white and make them their own black and white, I think are the ones that are going to be the most successful coming into the uh, this decade and going forward. And so I tell you all this because I think it's really to say, and I use the term that there's an incongruence uh, between how capital works and how companies need to be built and harvested and fostered and developed in order for them to be um, the best and brightest companies in the world. And so, you know, for me, you know, what we're looking to build is something where, you know, sort of we're taking the, the axis of investing and operating and recognizing that uh, our horizons are ones that are gonna be perhaps indefinite or take a lot longer. Um, you're seeing companies, a couple companies do like Teeny Capital uh, is one. Uh, there's another gentleman and his name slipping my mind, but he, uh, I think it's um, called Perpetual Capital. He has a 26 year horizon for returns. And so I'm not necessarily suggesting that, you know, our companies are not gonna get returns for 26 years. But what I am suggesting is, again, in order for you to foster, develop, and build the best and brightest, I keep saying this, companies, um, you need to be able to balance the fragility of capital management, investment management, asset management, rates of return, prudent capital allocations, prudent investing um, with creating intrinsic value, creating value that cut, touches your customers, building fanatical or, 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 or tremendous excitement around that constituency that's in love with you. And that, that is not always very linear in how you invest in those things. Got it, got it. So, uh, so you really have a clear uh, idea in your mind, a clear vision of what, how you want to mold your companies. You talk about extraordinary experiences. You talk about uh, the non-linearity, so you need some flexibility. You talk about um, bringing in extraordinary people. And I'm gonna to touch on that in a minute. Uh, so you, you seem to have a clear idea how to make this brand uh, a disruptive brand and, and what is the, the opportunity there. Uh, do you have like an overarching management philosophy? I call these management blueprints. Do you use kind of a, a, a coherent framework that you are implementing in your businesses or, or it's all homegrown uh, you know, things that you picked up and you're intuitively putting them together? Yeah, well, I think um, I think there's a couple of things, right? So I think, you know, starting at the top, when you think about the promise, which I alluded to earlier, and sort of the the mission and the vision for the company. I mean, uh, when we think about a blueprint, uh, a couple of things come into mind. I think number one is is that you know anyone we're bringing into our company, uh, we're very thorough and very rigid about um, making sure that those we're bringing into the organization in a lot of cases, uh, have these very similar beliefs in their own personal life. Um, because uh, if, if they don't, 
um, then what happens is you create perhaps some, some friction with regards to um, these beliefs. Um, so I, I, I'm all for friction. I'll come to that in a minute. But the friction should be about how we get somewhere, not what that place is. Mm -hmm. And I think in order for us to be aligned on that, I think it has to start out by principally and on a values level, having a great sense of alignment. Doesn't mean you and I are gonna agree on everything, that's okay. But I think that that is, um, that is a really important thing. I think the other thing is, is that we want people uh, to really breed this idea of, of creating the exceptional every day because you know that will allow internally for us to do that, which gives us the highest propensity externally to do that. Like you can't ask your people if you give them suboptimal environments to work with, uh, work within, or you're not giving them the right compensation packages or the right uh, other perks to to incentivize them to be exceptional. Um, you want it to be in their DNA, and then these are just ways to further pull it out. But you can't ask them to. Uh, to deliver exceptional to your customer if you're not giving them exceptional too. So there's this kind of give and take relationship. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is, is that, you know, we want people to come into our business that really have a performance mentality at the forefront of what they do. At the end of the day, even though I sell you on all the reasons why, you know, private equity and why it does or doesn't work and why we're building long-term companies, you still got to perform. And so I think people are coming with a level of accountability uh, people that uh, uh, take their 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 work very seriously, and that that put performance at the forefront of what they do is very very crucial. And you know, I think that the last thing would be is um, you know is that and this is something that we talk about internally is um, you know we're in the game of inches. You know, you hear that term in like football, right? It's like so in American football, you're like you know the NFL is a game of inches. It it's the oh, reason why a team wins versus why a team loses. It's why. You may score a touchdown versus, you know, kicking a field goal. It's why, you know, you may have a fumble versus having, uh, not having a fumble, right? And I think that that is very uh, esprit de corps, if you will, to our holdings and the way we think about business. Um, and so this isn't to scare anybody, um, but this is to remind everybody that we are in the business of, uh, or in the game of inches. We're in the game of inches and in how we engage with our guests and making sure we hold up to that promise. We're in the game, game of inches and in how we perform uh, and making sure we don't lose line of sight of that. We're in the game of inches when we talk about um, making mistakes or mental mistakes or error repeating mistakes. We don't, we don't have time or patience for those things. And so, you know, we really look at this thing from, from that first. And, and then of course, you know, uh, it's aligning on that North Star, um, which is where we wanna be and why we wanna be there. Um, because I got to be frank, you know, you can't own a bunch of companies and grow them if I have a strong stranglehold on every single person in the organization. I, I really spend so much time up front and I get very involved in this process. So when we're bringing people in, you know, look, it's not, it's not like, you know, can't bat a thousand percent at it, but we want to bat as high as possible to a thousand percent. And then by doing that, it allows me when I bring them in, I have the confidence they're going to perform and you give them the rope to, to make the decisions they need and to be the best that they can be. Um, because the reality is I can't do everything. I, it's impossible. And I don't need to be the smartest guy at the table. I, I, and I also know where I want to play and how I want to play. And so um, we got to be clear about that North Star, like I said, and uh, we can debate how we get there all the time because that's, that's good banter. Uh, but, you know, you don't want to debate what the North Star is because I think that that creates uh, undue friction and perhaps uh, uh, a misalignment that, that may um, sever or hurt or, you know, uh, drive a relationship to no longer be um, a relationship, at, you know, at that point. So um, that makes sense. That, that makes sense. Uh so, so basically you talk about this North Star. So it's, it's really important to have alignment on the end result and how you get there. You, you basically want everyone to be engaged in this discussion. You welcome friction there, how we figure it out, what our strategy is going to be to get or to our goal is, is up for grabs, which, which makes a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, sense. Now I'd like to switch gears here uh, and I'd like to ask you about one of the concepts uh, I read on, on your uh, website, or maybe it came up in our discussion actually before this thing. It, it struck my ear when you talked about 
the importance of an intelligence engine. So you say that for every business you own, you have to have an intelligence engine inside. So what do you mean by this and, and how do you create that kind of intelligence engine? Yeah, so, you know, we're trying to take a, a much more um, scientific data laden um, approach to how we obtain, access, and cut, and then lastly, use data to help us um, really first and foremost, build a deeper connection with our, our loyalist, um, and then focus on how we can get better you know, and the key objectives that will make our business tick going forward. And so um, we have and will continually invest in, um, in technology, uh, data mining, data warehousing, uh, various touch points, uh, whether it be anything from physical environment, you know, uh, data texting, chatting, you know, working with knock, knock rooms with our operators to see what's kind of going on heat mapping values of seeds, understanding lifetime value of key, of key loyalists to our business. How do we increase that? How do we you know, target them more profoundly? You know, I think this idea of first party data, I think has been really important for a long time. I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's not, but I think it's gonna become even more important because of really two reasons. Number one, third party data is gonna become more and more difficult as government uh, further puts more and more clamps on how third party data is administered. Uh, which I actually think is a good thing. Um, your ability to get peripheral data is going to become more challenged in light of, I think, more and more, uh, you know, more and more stringency around, um, you know, protecting that data, which means that it's going to force more companies to have to invest in first party, um, which I think is going to almost create a, a, to some extent, a, a you know, a, a, a rub between, you know, great companies and not great companies because, um, you're going to have to invest in this now. And so if Steve, honestly, like if, if, if I wanted to get your information, cause, and you're a loyalist of our business, I'm, I can tell you that uh, our customers, our guests, our consumers, they will be willing to give us that information. And as long as I'm targeting them and engaging with them in a profound manner, and I'm learning about them because I want to get to know more about them so that I can enhance their life. Or as I said earlier, make the everyday exceptional for them uh, in the way that I can best do it. Um, then we're going to have no issue continuing to get that information. So as we get that information, you know, we look at, you know, a lot of various uh, measures that I just alluded to some of them, but, you know, I'll use, let's just say you as an archetype, as an example, you dine in one of my restaurants uh, three times a week, you go in, um, you know, three mornings every single week and you order, you know, uh, breakfast, and you always order a side of um, bacon, extra bacon and sausage. Okay. And I see that over time, I can see that Steve is, you know, Steve Prada is ordering from us, the lifetime value is X. Um, you know, their average check is Y. Um, this is what they order. And I can see that time and time again, he's getting the same thing. And he's also ordering again, extra protein. So the question then would be, right, is, um, is, is okay, um, does Steve know that we own other things? And so I could go to you and say, hey, Steve, I see that, I see that, you know, you're ordering a lot of bacon and sausage every morning at my breakfast joint. Are you aware that we own this barbecue business? And you might say, no, I had no idea. Great. You know, why don't you come to our barbecue business on us? We're going to take care of you. You know, the cost of that acquisition is really just the cost of the meal which is the wholesale cost and I guess the derivative dollars of creating it. It's not a very big lift, but then I have you go to this business and now you say, Oh my God, I love this business. And I can effectively take you from spending three incidences in a week to let's just say for simple math, six incidences in a week. And let's assume for a moment that there are 21 meal periods in a week, three meal periods a day, seven days a week. I now just two times increased your, your frequency across my portfolio. Now, Right. So now, now you're, you're more, you're, I don't want to say higher value to demean people who are not increasing their frequency, but like, you're now coming into this new echelon. It's like, okay, you're spending 12% of the meal periods a week, you know, three over 21, give or take 12. Now you're spending 24, 25, 26. Okay. Uh, your PPA has gone up. Your, your total dollars spent have gone up. Uh, you're frequenting more with us. Uh, so now we'll target you differently. You know, might say, okay, look, like how do we, now we're seeing how they're spending more money and they're doing more things with us. 
Uh, how do we deepen that relationship? How do we connect further? And so that would be an example of you know, how we're leveraging data um, and technology both today and how we plan to going forward uh, to really build that. Again, with one goal in mind, which is to make the everyday exceptional. If I can continue to give things that make your day better or more exceptional, then I feel like that that's a part of what we're trying to do. Yeah, I, lo I love that, uh, that idea. And obviously a lot of companies are doing some variation of that, but you made it very tangible that 21 meal periods. And if you can get some more, you know, get the customer up from three to six, you're doubling the lifetime value of that customer. And you are now taking 25% of their valid uh, meal valid. And then maybe have, they have relatives, they have friends. So there's also this uh, leverage effect. They become more of a loyalist. Uh, that's fascinating. And yeah. another question I want to ask you about is this idea of the maturation process of, of the business and how important it is to understand that. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so we talked about this offline. So we talked about um, a couple of things, uh, rock stars and superstars, um, you know, which are, are really, you know, uh, superstars are your generalists, your rock stars are your specialists. Um, you know, that level of organizational planning um, really sort of is driven by various need states of, 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 of the company, right? And so that can vary on a lot of levels. Going back to your, and I guess I would say that's part of answering your question, which sort of is, you know, the maturation. So, you know, companies, um, companies are like, you know, humans in a lot of ways, right? I mean, like, you know, they start out as babies uh, and then they grow up and then, you know, they, they start riding a bike on training wheels and then they're riding a real bicycle and then they go to preschool and kindergarten and so on. And then they eventually are in college and then they grow up and then they go to work and then they have kids and, right? And so when you think about the maturation process of humanity, uh, I think companies have a very similar maturation process too. And I think, you know, depending on that maturation process, um, companies can grow a lot faster than humans can um, because depending on the kind of company you have, your lightning in the bottle, as an example, it can, it can move really quickly. You get this, you know, really significant hockey stick growth. So, you know, one of the things I've learned, you know, my short business career so far, uh, just based on the various companies uh, I've been a part of, um, currently and previously is, uh, you know, looking at the maturation process of companies and then recognizing what you need at those times to be successful. A great example of that would be, there are just some uh, people who just are so resourceful, so scrappy, so entrepreneurial. They can wear uh, 10 hats, have no issue with it from a business that's just a, a piece of paper that might get to, um, I don't know, $10 million in revenue. And please don't hold, revenue is not the only barometer uh, per se for, for what the example I'm gonna make is, but just more <laughs> illustrative in nature, right? And then, yeah, you, know, you get the $10 million. Um, let's assume you have proof of concept and now, cause you're generating $10 million in sales. Um, you'd like to think that your business has gone from like super scrappy, super tenacious, and in many cases, you're not losing that because that's really, in a lot of cases, part of your DNA. But then you have to start to professionalize your business because you need different things in order to take your business from 10 million to uh, 25 million, right? And so sometimes, and really a lot of times, the person that helped you build it from a piece of paper to 10 million, uh, unfortunately, may be left back because they don't bring some of the skill sets that you need to go from 10 million to 25 million, or then 25 million to 50 million, or 50 million to 100 million. And so depending on the trajectory of the business, you know, you're always having to do some very deep evaluations, um, both when it comes to investing in human capital and systems and other various disciplines to you know, balance the fragility of not losing the essence of your business while professionalizing the business, right? And I think um, those, are, those are really hard objectives because it's, per, it's personal from the standpoint of, you know, you grow, grow such a fondness uh, of the people that have helped you along the way get to a certain place. And, you know, for the, you know, in some cases, if you're a serial entrepreneur, you might just be able to take someone once you get to 10 million and put them in another company that you're starting. But if, for most people, um, you have to let them go. And, um, you know, and, and that's hard, you know, because there's a humane element to this, because um, a lot of these companies are highly human capitally intensive. And so 
Um, you know, growth and need, um, depending on company and depending on uh, how fast that growth has taken place can be, um, so, well, it's something that a CEO or a founder led company that are still very much involved are, are having to make these decisions uh, sometimes at warp speed, depending on how quickly the business is growing. So uh, at some point, you know, you want to get to a place, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, where you have rock stars and superstars. You need both. You know, generally, generally your C team or your C cabinet or your SWAT team, as we call it, you know, they're generally more generalist um, because uh, they need to be. Because in your C role, you do have your hands in a few jars. Um, and really, you got to know enough about those jars. You probably have a super strong competency. And then you have a, a fairly strong competency in the other areas mm -hmm. so that, you know, you can manage and lead appropriately. Um, and then you have really great specialists. And these are people that are just can go really deep. You know, mm -hmm. I kind of said generalists are more horizontal and, and yeah. specialists are more vertical. And they're just subject matter experts. You know, they know their stuff and you have to have them too. Yeah. Um, and so there's just a lot to unpack there, I know. And I was trying to give you, you know, an example, hopefully a good one, but, um, and there are a lot of other examples, of course, as well, but um, this, is, this is something that you see happen very quickly uh, with a lot of companies. And frankly, where a lot of, I think where I look back and probably where I stumbled a fair bit, and by no means am I perfect at it today. Um, I would say that uh, that was one area where, you know, we had a lightning in the bottle and, um, probably the naivety because you've never done it before of figuring out what you really need and why you really need it. Um, you know, is something where, you know, now I'm a little bit more uh, or a fair bit more uh, intelligent about, about those things uh, based on the various things we have today. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, I like two things about this approach. So one is like, I like the positivity of how you distinguish between the tech, the, the specialists and the generalists and, and yes, we, we, you know, everyone has the experience of promoting the star, rock star salesperson who actually didn't become a superstar sales manager because it's not in their DNA. They, they really like to um, work on their own and they are great producers, so don't do that. And you need both, so you need the rock star and the superstar, I love that. I also love the, the positivity of, uh, you know, the, 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 tech, the special, specialist is equally important. Uh, the rock star, you want the rock star uh, in your business. Uh, you want to keep them, even if you cannot promote them, you want to give them the opportunity to go. That's right. Uh, that's Yeah, not, not, ever, not everyone's meant to grow, Steve, you know, like, and, um, and, and also I'll say maybe differently, um, you know, is, is that, you know, like growing is like, there's a lot of ways to grow. <laughs> You know, like, I mean, you can grow in title bumps, you can grow in scope within current uh, role, you can grow in a lot of ways. So, you know, um, in other words, uh, all growth is not equal. You yeah. know, all growth is not equal. So I, I think it's just, you know, trying to you know, look, you want to put people on a path, you know, especially in a, like a lot of our companies where we have growth companies. And so, you know, there are definitely people who are very excited about this idea that they are, um, you know, a part of this growth. And, you know, I didn't mention this earlier and I meant to is I'll tell you another thing that's really important uh, in companies, I think, in, in today's environment is people feeling like assuming that you're aligned principally and on a value system to how the company sort of thinks, um, really contributing, you know, it's like an intangible benefit, which is contributing like or interweaving your DNA into an organization. You know, it's funny because, you know, I talked even earlier and I just, it slipped my mind. Um, but, but just on this topic, I mean, you know, yeah, the compensation, the bennies and that stuff does matter. I mean, in many cases, let's be honest, you got to be able to live and you want to have good perks and stuff. But what I found is that, you know, a lot of people we hire, especially in my, uh, my generation, the millennial generation or the Gen Z generation, you know, they're just so much more about creating impact and feeling like uh, they're not just another number, you know, on a, on a pay roster. Um, and we try our damnedest to, to make sure no one feels that way. Um, right. And we really feel like, you know, if people can interweave their fabric into the company, there's this, uh, I guess that benefit, even though it's intangible, might be in some cases the greatest benefit you can offer uh, somebody in this climate. Um, and so, 
you know, I think that was just another point I wanted to bring up just on this topic of people and growth and uh, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot there. and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot there for sure, but I uh, wanted to put that yeah. out there. Well, I appreciate it. And, and unfortunately our, our format 45 minutes is not enough to cover everything, but I definitely agree that it's super important that be, give the opportunity to people to be part of a great story, to be uh, really excited about your purpose and be part of that. And, and that's, that's very energizing and, and very attractive for people to, to make this impact. I also love this idea uh, of this rockstar superstars from at many levels. So one of the things that struck me when you were explaining that, uh, you know, the people who got you to the 10 million will not get to the 25 to the 50 in some cases. And, and you know, I, I see some companies who are stuck at the level of the 10 million or 20 million because they are just not willing to let go of people that they are emotionally connected to. Yeah. Or they are not willing to, to make some moves on the chessboard because sometimes maybe that person is no longer a superstar. Uh, they're not a leader, but they would be a great rock star. And if you just saw them on the idea that, hey, you don't have to be a leadership team, but we really need you uh, here in this specialty to deepen us and to, to get us the expertise and deliver it. And you just move some, some chess uh, pieces around. And if everyone is aligned on the greater mission and they are all love your culture, then they're going to play along. They're going to be okay with being in a different role as long as they can contribute and they are appreciated. Mm -hmm whatever they bring to the business. We all, we all struggle with this as leaders. I mean, again, there's a humane side of this, right? And yeah. that, that part is uh, that part is tough. I also think uh, siphoning, Steve, between when you got to play checkers and when you have to play chess, because you're not always playing chess. And frankly, you got to play checkers to play chess. Um, mm -hmm. Chess is the graduation of being able to be a good checker player. And, mm -hmm. you know, being a checker player means getting your house in order, you know, keeping your priorities in line. Uh, making sure you're not, um, you know, getting ahead of your skis. And, um, you know, I think a lot of companies are playing checkers still today uh, just to kind of try to get themselves in order so they can play chess. Mm -hmm. um, or or you're balancing, I guess, maybe I could say it differently is, you know, you're playing checkers at times and chess at times, mm -hmm. right? Because you're playing defense and offense. You're trying to you know, sort of balance the the fragility of uh, a lot of the macro and secular trends that are taking place that are, you know, beyond our control, but they do affect us. And, you know, how do we manage through that stuff? And so, you know, I think that's another part of all this. That, um, I know we won't have time to go over today, perhaps yeah. in a subsequent conversation, but. Yeah, well, lots of great ideas here. I mean, I, I'm really struggling what's gonna be the title of this show because uh, I thought, oh, this is a great title. This is a great title. And I've got like 15 of these. So I just have to uh, figure out which one's gonna be the most uh, impactful and the most representative of the conversation we had. I really enjoyed it. So uh, maybe I'll have to invite you and next time and come back for a take two uh, to unpack some of the other ideas that you have. Definitely lots of great concepts to work with. So uh, if people would like to learn more about what you do and connect with you or visit your restaurants, what do they do? How do they find you? Where do they find you? Yeah, so um, you can go to salesholdings.com. Um, I didn't mention, but we are introducing a new consumer platform uh, called catalog.co, which we're very excited about. Um, so a lot of the, the various operating companies will live under that platform, uh, something we'll be introducing in the fall. Uh, and you can check me out on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not very big on social. It's kind of one of those things for me. I'm kind of like a, not an anti-social. I, I can see why it benefits. Uh, the companies do it, but I, I just try to stay focused on doing a good job and I don't try to get caught up in, I don't know if people really care about what I'm doing all the time. I mean, maybe they would, I don't know. But like for me, I, I like to kind of separate my my life a little bit from the, yeah. the business side versus the, the personal side. But you can check me out LinkedIn. Um, probably the best place to check, check me yeah. out. Yeah. What I understand is that introverts don't do as well on social media as extroverts because you actually have to be social on social media. And I struggle with that. You don't have to be social. That's, that's an operative point. Yes, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> because that's what it's all about. So uh, that, you know, I struggle with that, that too sometimes. Well, listen, um, so Steve Salis, the founder and CEO of uh, Salis Holdings. Uh, so if you're in Washington, D.C., check out uh, his, uh, Steve's restaurants. You can find them on uh, um Say again, the, the website, which has your uh, portfolio of companies that's coming online in September. 
Yeah, so um, well, Salus Holdings, it's uh, S-A-L-I-S Holdings, plural, dot com. And then the, the new platform will be introduced in the fall. It's called Catalog. Catalog. Uh, but uh, with a UE, because um, we wanted to bring uh, a little bit more of a exceptional quality to Catalog and give it a little zest. Uh, catalog, catalog.co, C-A-T-A-L-O-G-U-E.co. Okay, so definitely check out Catalog.co. Check, uh, check out Steve on LinkedIn as well. And if you enjoyed the show, then please uh, rate and review us on YouTube or on Apple Podcast. And, uh, you know, come back next week. We'll have another exciting entrepreneur coming to visit us. Steve? You'll have to bring me back next week. (laughs) Finish our conversation, yeah. Right, yeah. No, definitely, uh, I'll I'll bring you back sometime because we have a lot left to cover. So thank you, Steve, for coming on. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Steve. Have a great day and listeners, uh, stay tuned next week.